Yeah, again, strange looks from the wife. Yes, welcome once again to a Star Trek Starships video. And the reason I'm showing this is this is the special that came through just the other day. So we're getting two Star Trek videos quite close to each other. So if you haven't seen that one, just scroll back slightly or look on the playlist. And it's just down the road. And now for the two regular normal spaceships. This is upside down, so the address doesn't show. But now take it off camera, as the New Zealanders would say. Off camera. <coughs> and flip it. I love to take out the contents without me seeing. I don't want to spoil. Oh. Can you give it to me then? I get into it. Um, not looking. Not looking. And. Uh, uh, Something else. Ah, new binder! We got a new binder with this one! Yay! Hey, finally. That means I paid a fortune this month. <laughs> right, oh, I just saw that. Okay, give me the first one. See if we'll play. I had the second one. Oh, I can see it. Okay. And the first one this month is the Starfleet Runabout. Now, the guy, I know the guy that's uh, been that commissions and models shown this one quite a bit because they've been doing it quite a bit because it's been quite requested so let's have a look we've got the Starfleet runabout generic sort of name isn't it Danube class uh, launch 24th century length 23.1 meters maximum speed warp 5 that's, that's pretty about the size. I can see it <sighs> can't get the staff Warp 5, that's pretty fast for, for a runabout. Look at the star, the expensive running starships. I just bloody run the runabout. It's just, yours. Oh, thank you. That's just about my tea. How can you say any tea is yuck? It has got Your sugar tea in. is lovely. Yours is sugar free. Hmm. Then sweet enough. Right. Yeah, keep telling yourself that. Constructed 2365, launched 2368. Yeah, must, must have been built by uh, one of the England's councils then, because that's how long it takes them to get anything done. We'll still be waiting. Yes. Crew, two to four, warp five, four phaser arrays and one micro torpedo launcher. Oh, not a big torpedo, one micro torpedoes. Stand assembly. Okay, so we got runabout, designing the ship, building and filming the ship and on screen. The Starfleet runabout, resembling an enlarged shuttlecraft. Yeah. Uh, runabouts were multi-purpose ships often assigned to space stations. Space stations! Space stations! Space ship! Sorry, that's a Benny's spaceship joke out of the Lego movie, which I'm going to be watching after this. There's some booze uh, The cockpit of the runabout was similar to that found on shuttlecraft, but was slightly larger. The primary flight controls were duplicated at the two forward stations, but the normal configuration was to have the port station set at the mission commander's controls and the starboard station set as the pilot's controls. And some oh, look at the nice graphics of it going through the uh, Deep Space Nine wormhole. I think a Deep Space Nine over there. Data feed. The runabouts could be equipped with a roll bar mounted pod over the spine of the vessel. Optional £3,000 extra. Available at your dealership only. These pods were easily removable and normally contained sensor equipment. Okie dokie. And here we have the layout and some people having fun. They're not having fun. It's Diana, look, she's laughing, which makes you wonder what Data's doing with his right hand. Never mind, dear. What's Geordie doing with his feet? Like playing mm. footsie with the counsellor. No, 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 no. He's playing footsie with Picard. In his sexy bald head. Just like mine. Nothing wrong with a follicly challenged gentleman. Mine's not proceeded that far yet. Right, data feed, defensive payloads, special laboratories, emergency habitats or additional living quarters were just some of the different modules that could be fitted to the swappable central section of a runabout between the cockpit and the habitat area. So they're like the Ford Focuses of runabouts. Name change. Uh, the runabout scene in the episode Penubua was originally called USS Ganges until the writers realised it had already been destroyed. <laughs> so the name was changed to the USS Gander. Hmm. Yes, it must be difficult to keep track of Star, Star Trek 
history and timeline. For the database. <laughs> yes. The design origins of the, <coughs> the runabout can be traced all the way back to the Galileo shuttlecraft. It appeared in the original series. And if you go on YouTube, this has actually been restored, the original model. So you can actually go watch documentaries on that. If you're into that, it's quite interesting. Uh, so, what's that? The pattern ah. one. The SD-103 shuttlecraft was modified with warp nacelles and various components from constituting the Lewisian class and Miranda class models to become the USS Ginginola. The model was seen in the next generation model relics and was originally going to be used to be used unchanged as the runabout. Yeah, you can see why they changed it a bit. <clears throat> right, okay, um, looks like a wedge. Wedge with wings. The door stop for the space station. Yeah. And then that's, that's quite a good bit, good bit. And then, hmm, warp slide, cargo, oh, that's right, yeah, thing. Yeah, it's kind of like a Lego ship, you can just put it together. No. Lego. There we go, so designing and building and filming the runabout. <laughs> oh yes, good idea, although I've partially seen it. Uh, <coughs> so it's uh, still model based at this time. Hmm. The model actually doesn't look that good when you get close up to it, but by the time they've finished with the filming techniques, right. it's would be much better. Every time I see this, I see something out of Battlestar Galactica. It looks like this very Battlestar Galactica-y. Especially that section. Yeah. <laughs> yes, and there's a... The original Battlestar, not the <coughs> modern reboot, which is, isn't... The Runabout Studio model featured in the first five seasons of Star Trek Deep Space Nine. It was later sold at auction for $33,600. Dollars. And, oh, it's trivia. The USS Grand Rio was the only runabout of the original three runabouts assigned to Deep Space Nine to survive throughout Star Trek Deep Space Nine's seven year run. A total of seven named runabouts and three unnamed runabouts were destroyed over the course of the show. Uh, Very key careless of them. Yeah. Key appearances Deep Space Nine, The Marquee Part 2, and One Little Ship. Ah, I was going to say, first appearance is Timescape, um, final appearance, uh, What You Leave Behind, Deep Space Nine, which is probably the last episode, uh, judging by the title. Covering up the next ship there, and trying to flip this without seeing, so we can see the back picture. Back picture. And there we go. What's this barcode thing doing here? I don't know. That's not on the previous ones, is it? Mm -hmm. I don't remember barcodes, unless I'm going oh. mental. <laughs> Just say Facebook while the fluffy looks. Yes. Ah, yes it is. I'm just mad. Oh, camera. Right. Okie dokie. So that's that. Let's put that safely to one side. And shit, please! Ooh. At first glance, <coughs> looks promising. Hmm. She looks quite good, this one. Let's uh, remove her. Remove the box. Remove the top. Remove the shippy. Which actually looks, uh, looks promising. And uh, hand over the bits to Fluffy. And uh, we shall. Uh, hmm. Hmm. I have to say, I can see it on the camera screen there. And uh, in real life, it does look. Better. Now, okay, overall, looks pretty good. We do have some minor moulding errors here, here, and on the nose there, but it is minor. So, I think we can let them off of that. There's not much detail on the back rear, but I don't think there's much detail on the original, to be honest. Uh, nose is well done, it's all painted nicely. Oh, oh a few moulding marks on there. But that's only a minor thing, I'm not really fussed about that. It's not like it's a £100 model. Hmm. But that doesn't mean you can get away with it. I'm not giving you free licence to get away with it, guys. Right, oh, we have paint failure. Paint failure there on the rear nose cells. Mm. It's got a bit ski whiffed. Mm. See, that one's over there. And that one's there. Fluffy examining. Mm. 
I'll get onto the production department and start sacking people. Thank you. Right. Okay, so overall... <coughs> more paint work. What's going on? Paintwork issues. <coughs> Standards, guys. Oh, dear. That sounds good. Uh, overall, I'm actually quite happy with that. It's quite good. That's your 10 pound model. Yes, but overall, yes, uh, even with the flaws, I'd still buy that. That's uh, a good little model. I like that. I think, but well done, guys. A few minor molding errors, more than you see on other ships, but other than that, it is a satisfying model. And wow! It sits on the stand well. We'll show you that a little bit when we drop this stand down to have a look properly, but it sits nicely there. I'll just quickly show you profile as best I can without moving the camera. There we go. Ta da! Ah, kidoki! So that's the runabout. Overall, pretty happy with that. Next! Ooh, the Cardassian Hideki class. Would you like to do this one? No. Oh, go on. No. You know you want to. No. Okay. I'll sit and criticise. No change of them. Right. Launch 24th century. Length 85.78 metres. Ooh, oh, misses. Maximum speed. Hey, that 0.78 of a metre is very important in Star Trek design. Hmm. Does 0.78 of a metres make a difference to you girls, does it? Yes, it does. Okay. Right. Oh, oh, welcome back Fluffy, because she was, wasn't was well enough to make the last video, so people were complaining she was absent. Right, okay, I'm done back. that straight. Uh, done that bit. Crew, 30. Okay. Uh, <coughs> weapon, four spiral wave disruptors, whatever that was. Uh, one aft disruptor. Uh, disruptors. Disruptor cannon. Hideki glass style designing ship. Post Illustrator Jim, sorry, <laughs> Production Illustrator Jim Martin, and on screen. Now you get this order order online in case you're not subscribed. Okay, let's have a look at the Hideki class or Hideki class or whatever it's called. Not quite sure. What are you playing with? I'm getting something to hide the back of the. Oh, hang on. Can you use this again? No, it's okay. I can just use this. There we go. Right, uh, the Hideki class ships were primarily patrol ships, but they were also used as attack fighters in the Dominion War by the Cardassian. The Cardassians zealously guarded their borders and used fast, highly maneuverable Hideki class sh uh, ships to intercept any intruders who entered their territory, as well as defending Cardassian space. Hideki class. Pardon? Cardassian. What did I say? Cardassian. Oh, okay. Cardassian space. Oh. Uh, Hideki class ships were they deployed in squadrons alongside long, larger Galore class warships in battle engagements. I've got a feeling this is not going to be one of my favourite models. It doesn't look. Uh, uh, yeah, let's have a look. Anyway, okay, more pictures. <coughs> Goldovec was a Cardassian officer in the Fourth Order. He was also the commander of the Vector, a Galo class vessel that pursued. Oh, excuse me. Could. Uh. Uh. Could check. Uh. Uh. Check out his marquee raider into the Badlands in 2371. Ivek was in command of the Hodeki class vessel that intercepted a runabout being piloted by Chief Miles O'Brien. Ivek then arrested O'Brien on fabricated charges that he had supplied weapons to Marquis before taking him to Cardassia for trial. Angry! He's angry. What do you be if you look like that? It looks like a... Uh, it looks like a... Something you get in private areas, apparently. Yep. Some sort of louse. <clears throat> anyway, yes. Do it. Hmm. Main bridge, over there. Okay, that's the back. Uh, disruptor wall. Disruptor wave cannon, embedded warp engine, Ooh, fancy. Disruptor, warp core, sensor array. Designing the Hideki. 
Somebody's gonna fit, uh, correct how I pronounce that. I just know Personally, it. Personally, I think it's pronounced hijacky, but. Yes. Ooh, models. Flying models. The internet is wrong. I was to find it was a union ship. Oh, I'll let you read that if you buy it. <laughs> Production illustrator John Jim, Jim Martin. In his three years with Star Trek Deep Space Nine, Jim Martin helped define the look of the show with his designs for sets, props, and ships. This is good because it's actually, as in others, just goes off the ship and sort of talks about other aspects. That looks like Helena Bon Carter out of Planet of the Apes. Oh, it could be a skeleton. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. In that guy's got something attached to his face. I know it's his nose, but it looks like something's attached to his face. That almost looks like a ship. Take the back off there, and it looks like a ship. I don't think the Fashion and Narada are in Star Trek. I don't know. Spaceship! Spaceship. That looks like Benny Spaceship! From the Lego movie. Looks like something else you get out of Van Summers. You might have the gutter. Oh, I know what's coming next. I don't think I lifted it far enough. An unusual ship coming next. And... Sorry, I they almost hit the shuttlecraft. On screen. Uh, first appearance, Profit and Loss, Deep Space Nine. TV appearances, Star, Star Trek Deep Space Nine. And designed by Jim Martin, so it doesn't appear in any films. Key appearances, Star Trek Deep Space Nine, Profit and Loss. And Star, Star Trek Deep Space Nine, Tacking into the Wind. Trivia. The American actress Mary Crosby, who played Cardassian Natima Long in the Star Trek Deep Space Nine episode Puffed and Loss, is the daughter of legendary singer Bing Crosby and actress Catherine Crosby. She's also the aunt of Star Trek Next Generation actress Denise Crosby, who played Tasha Yar in the first season of the show. Yar! Mary Crosby is perhaps best known for her role in as Christine Shepard, the actor who shot J.R. Ewing in the television drama drama series Dallas. I remember that. And as it turns out it was just a dream sequence. <laughs> right. And back page. I know what that ship is. There we go. There's your woodlows type thing. Knit. Knit. Right. Being renamed give the instructions. Actually, it looks a lot better than I thought it was going to. Hmm. That's the front. So, this one also looks quite promising. Look. Do we have any mould issues? Mould issues? We shouldn't have any mould issues. Moulding issues. Over there. Over there. And. That's an awkward one. Ah, uh, there's the ship. And the first thing you'll notice, it's very matte in texture. There's no shine to the paint apart from these sections here. Here's the front. Side. The bottom. And the other side here. And the top, obviously. And uh, there's a ship. Well, the model, yeah, it's on the models. Not too bad for you, paint issues there. Uh, other than that, it's uh, pretty good. Fine as a model. It's just that the ship. Uh, probably have to see some of the episodes, but the ship. <coughs> more interested in the Federation ships, really, I think. I don't know, some of the enemy ships are quite good. Some of them, but more, some of them are like this. And, uh, some of them are a bit. Meh. Got to see the episodes. Imagination doesn't get going like this. So I suppose in the episode look good. Oh. Yeah, I suppose in the episode look good. Yeah, let's just click that one. Warp core straight to the nebulas. So the scale difference. It almost it fits on the <laughs> disc of the vengeance. Ta -da. Has anyone time. spotted the Cardassians? No, sir. Oh, look, the Vengeance has got nets. <laughs> Somebody get the Vengeance some cream. <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Right, so let's have a look at this one. Oh, it's that. Well, that's a wide stand. 
It's a white ship, I suppose. Right. Um, that, uh, That's what I'm doing. <coughs> oh, got one in. There we go. That fits nice and secure. That is secure. Hmm, there we go. You can just sort of that issue out anyway. Not for these two. <coughs> there we go. Set a side profile as it sits on its hand. So let's drop the cameras, bring the two together. <laughs> and the two magazines displayed. I like the freezer one. <laughs> I like the freezer ship. Are we just renaming these these ships? Yeah, I'm going to you know, change the format now. These are now. Well, we have to change the format now and again. You know, a bit of variety and stuff in there. So this is freezer that's knit, and this is the one that's going to take a shit. <laughs> hey, <laughs> mind your language. Give me the vengeance. I wanted the vengeance to have a longer life, uh, life. didn't have much of a life. Give it a stroke, Fluffy, on camera. Oh, hang on. Bring back up. Good vengeance, I know. It's so, so mistreated and abused in that film. See? He's crying. <sighs> poor vengeance. And for £25 a month, you too can give the poor abused starship a loving home. Yeah, poor vengeance. <laughs> Not as well. Anyway, assemble or just add to the fleet. <laughs> I'm gonna have to go to the shelf and the alcove. If you've done what I'm on about, it's in the last video. Or you can wait and just see it in this video in a second. Be right back. Right, so the fleet is assembled. Well, that's the bad guy fleet on the shelf. Yeah, apart from vengeance, which sort of is a good guy, bad guy type thing. He's but a misguided good guy. Yes. And there is Nit. I mean, uh, the uh, what's called Cardassian Hideki class Cardassian uh, sitting on the shelf. It's hard to get a shot there. Mm. Yes. So when we get a second shelf, we may we adjust to make it easier to look at. But there we go. That's the that's the bad guy shelf. And now we need to go to the yes, being the being babysat by Master Chief there. And let's go. To the good guy shelf. <laughs> and here is the good guy fleet, apart from the Borg oh. stuff there. Uh, with the uh, other Enterprise model there. Especially, especially. You may have to compare the uh, Star Trek to, sorry, the Enterprise to the Vengeance in the video. If anybody's interested in that, direct comparisons, let me know in the comments and I shall produce a video. But there is Phaser. Sorry, I mean uh, the run Starfleet around. run around in the collection. Phaser. Phaser. And uh, quite a good model that is. Yes. So, there we go. So, thank you all very much. You need to quit being dirty. You're a dirty boy.